Hi, welcome to educator.com. We're going to talk about F distributions today. So first, we're going to review other distributions we've covered besides F, namely Z and T. Then we're going to introduce the F statistic, um, also called the variance ratio. Uh, then we're going to talk about the distribution of all these Fs, a distribution of all these ratios. And finally, what alpha and p-value mean in an F distribution. Because eventually we're going to do hypothesis testing with the F statistic. OK, first, these other distributions. So um, we know how to calculate the Z uh, statistic. And we also know how to find the probability of such a Z value in a normal distribution, right? But what is a Z distribution, right? Well, imagine this. Take a data set. Let's just call it a population, right? We take a data set. And I'll just draw it as this circle, right? And we take some sort of sample from it of size n, right? Of size n. And we actually calculate the Z statistic for this sample, right? So we calculate, you know, so calculate Z equals get the mean of this little sample minus some mu divided by the standard error, right? So you do that, and then you plot the Z, right? So you plot that Z, right? Boom. Um, so, and then imagine you replace all those, uh, that sample again, so with replacement, and you draw another sample, and you do this again, and then you plot that guy, right? And then you dump it back in, you draw another sample, you calculate Z, look at this, right? So if you do that over and over again, many, many times, right? Many, many times. What you end up getting is a normal distribution over time. So many, many times if you plot z, you get a normal distribution. Oops. Normal distribution. And because of that, we also call this a z distribution, because it's a distribution made up of a whole bunch of, of z's, right? Um, and it has the shape of a normal distribution. So that's what we call a z distribution. Now, if you take that same idea and you do it, you get a sample, you get a sample, same size n, right? And instead of calculating z for that sample, you calculate t, right? If you do this, then, uh, and, and then you plot that, right? You plot that, and you do that over and over and over and over again, you get a t distribution, right? And this resulting t distribution follows the rules of the t distributions, um, where it depends on the degrees of freedom, how wide it is. Uh, the lower your degrees of freedom, it's sort of variable, but the higher, the bigger your um, degrees of freedom, the sort of less variable and more normal it looks, right? And so that's what we call a T distribution. So that's how the Z statistic and the Z distribution sort of go together. And this is how the T statistic and the T distribution sort of go together, right? And so you just sort of have to imagine taking a whole bunch of these samples, right? Calculating whatever statistic and then plotting that statistic and then looking at the shape of that st those statistics. So really what this is, is a, this is a sampling distribution of z's, right? So instead of an s-dom, it's an s does, right? The sampling distribution of z's. And this is a sampling distribution of t's, right? So s dot, right? Um, instead of using means or z-scores to plot uh, your points, instead you use the t-statistic. Right? And you could do that for anything. You could do it for standard deviation. You could do it for interquartile range. You can make a sampling distribution of anything you want. That's important to keep in mind as we go into F distributions. Okay, so 
First thing is, what is the F statistic? We know how to calculate the T statistic and the V statistic. What is the F statistic? Well, later on in, uh, in these lessons, we're going go, uh, to come across what we call the ANOVA, the analysis of variance. Analyze means to break down, right? And variance is, well, you know what variance is. It's the spread, right, of um, spread usually around the mean of your data set. And so when we analyze variance, we're going to be breaking down variance in, into its multiple components, right? And uh, the F ratio happens to be a ratio of those component uh, variances, okay? And so I just want you to get sort of the big idea behind the F ratio. Not exactly how to calculate it, we'll get into the details of that later on, but the general concept. So the F statistic usually is this idea that we have some, uh, we have, let's say, two samples, right? X1, X2, X3, right? Y1, Y2, Y3, right? So we have these two samples, right? Now there's always some variation within the sample. Within X, there's some variation, right? And within the Ys, there's some variation, right? So there's going to be some variation. But there's another variation here that we're really interested in. We're really interested in the difference between these two things, right? Between these two samples, right? So the F statistic really is taking those ideas and turning it into a ratio. And here's what the ratio looks like. It's really the between sample variance all over the within sample variance. And remember, variance is always squared, right? It's the average squared distance away from the mean. And so because of that, this is a squared number, this is a squared number, they're both positive, right? So this number is always going to be greater than zero, right? There's no way that this number could be less than zero. So the F statistic is always going to be greater than zero. Now another way to think about between sample variance and within sample variance is this. Whenever we do uh, these kind of tests, we're really interested in the differences between the samples, right? Like that's really important to us. Um, but sometimes their difference um, is, uh, is also, um, like a part of that difference is going to be um, just inherent variation, right? So sometimes there might be um, a difference between, let's say, you know, men and women, or um, people who got a tutorial versus people who didn't, right? Uh, people who studied for the test versus people who didn't. Uh, people went to private school versus people went to public school, right? There, there might be some difference between them, but that difference is also going to have variation, right? So this between sample variance often has inherent variation, just variance you can't do anything about, inherent variation, plus the real difference, the effect size between samples, right? And notice that we keep using this word between, and that is to indicate that part, right? So between, that's the part we're really interested in over, <coughs> and I should have written this in red, over within sample variance, right? And so here, there's inherent variation between x's and between the y's, right? And that's not something we're interested in, but, uh, but but it's good to know how variable our, our little samples are. Is everyone very, very similar to each other or is everyone very, very different, right? We need to compare the difference between the samples to the difference within the samples, right? So this, the inherent sample, uh, the within sample variation is just inherent variation. 
okay? So these are all different ways of saying the same thing. And the reason why I want to say it also like this is because later on, uh, we're not just going to be talking about between sample and within sample differences. Um, we're going to add on to those ideas. The final way I want you to sort of think about the F statistic is basically this. Ultimately, in hypothesis testing, we're going to want to know about differences between samples, right? That's the thing that we're really interested in. So it's going to be the variation that we want to explain, right? Because that's the, that's the reason that we did our research in the first place all versus the variation we cannot explain. Not with this design, at least, right? So in our, in our experimental design, we'll have these two groups. And hopefully, these groups will be um, similar to each other, but different, uh, similar within the group, but different between the groups, right? And, and that's why in an F statistic, we want this variation that we want to explain to be quite large, and this variation that we cannot explain or do anything about, it just comes along for the ride, where we want that to be relatively small. Okay, so let's just do a little bit of thinking about the F ratio. Now, if we had a very, very big difference between the groups, um, what kind of F ratio would we have? One that's greater than one, less than one, right? Um, well, if our uh, variation between the groups is bigger than the variation within the groups, then we should have a very large F. So that should be uh, F that's greater than one, right? So at least greater than one, but maybe a lot greater than one. It could be two over one or two over 0.5 or any of those values would show between sample variance that's very, a lot larger than within sample variance. And so um, if there's a lot of uh, within uh, sample variance, then um, that competes with the between sample variance, right? So let's say there's a big between sample difference, but there's also a lot of differences within the samples themselves. Then it sort of evens out, and you might see an F that's, that's smaller or even less than one, right, if this one is bigger than this one. So that's how you could sort of think about the F statistic. All right, now imagine getting that F statistic over and over and over again from a population and plotting a sampling distribution of F statistics. What would you get? Well, remember, the F can't go below zero, right? Because both numbers are going to be positive, right? So the F really stops at zero. But this is what the F statistic ends up looking like. This is a skewed distribution. And it has a, a positive tail. That means it goes uh, for a really long time on the positive side. It's one-sided, so it's not, uh, it's not symmetrical. It's actually asymmetrical. There's only a positive side. Um, and it's because it's a proportion of variances, and variances are positive, right? And like t, it's a family of distributions. And uh, you're going to be able to find the particular f distribution you're working with by looking at the degrees of freedom in the numerator, the one about between sample differences, and by looking at the denominator, the sort of leftover or uh, within, within sample differences, right? Variation. So, um, so you're going to need both of those numbers in order to find out which F statistic you're working with. And in uh, Excel, they'll actually ask you for the degrees of freedom for the numerator and denominator. Now, let's talk a little bit about what alpha means here. Alpha here, uh, it will still need a cutoff point, so critical F instead of a critical T or Z, right? We'll still need a critical F, and the alpha will still be our, um, our, our probability of making 
false alarm given that the null distribution is true. This is the null F distribution, just, uh, just saying, right? And the alpha would be the same thing, the probability of false alarm. So once you know what that alpha sort of, uh, how, how you sort of can picture that alpha, let's talk about what that alpha actually means, right? Um, if you go back to the original idea for the alpha, the original idea is this cutoff score. Cutoff, uh, cutoff level, right? So it's our level of tolerance for false alarms, right? How, uh, the probability, the false alarm probability that we will tolerate, right? And so we want alpha to be very, very low, right? Now, our, our alpha will be low, right? That's a smaller alpha than this one, right? Our alpha will be low if our critical F is very, very big, right? And what does it mean for F to be large? Large F. This means our between sample variation, variability, is greater than our within sample variability. Right? And that's what it means. And so as long as this is much larger than this, we have a large F, right? And that's going to mean a smaller, um, a smaller uh, chance of false alarm, right? Now the alpha is the cutoff level that we are going to set as the significance level, the level that we will tolerate. So what is the p-value? So the p-value will be given our samples F, um, this is the probability that we would get this F or higher by chance in this probability. So given our samples F, uh, actually it would be easier if I wrote it the way that I said it <laughs> probably. Yeah. Um, so the idea is the probability, the false alarm probability, uh, given uh, for um, F values, right, F statistics that are equal to or more extreme than our sample F, right? Then the F from our sample. So the probability that we would get an F greater than the one that we got, right? So F from the sample, right? So this is the F value uh, once we have our sample statistic. This is the F value that we're, uh, this is the um, probability of false alarm that we're willing to tolerate. So uh, it's the same idea as T statistics, um, the alpha and the p-value and T statistics. Uh, we're just now applying it to a slightly different looking distribution. All right, now on to our examples. Why does the F distribution stop at zero but go on in the positive direction until infinity? Well, we know why it stops at zero. The F distribution is a ratio of two positive numbers, right? And we know that they're positive because variance is squared, right? Thus making it always positive, right? Always going to be positive. Uh, but it goes on until infinity because there's no rule that says um, you can only be this much bigger in the numerator than the denominator, right? So the numerator can be like infinitely as big as the denominator, right? So it could go on forever and ever and ever. All right, example two. In an F test, also called a one-way ANOVA, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit, the p-value, uh, so let's say you did an F test and the p-value is 0.034. 
What is the best interpretation of this result? It is plausible that all the samples are roughly equal. Is that what it means? Well, let's think about it. So here we're thinking about, let's say, two samples, and we need this versus this, right? So the F value is between variation over within variation, right? And if we have a big F value, right? So let me draw my F distribution. If we have a big enough F value, so sample F, then we can have a small p value, 0.034. Okay. So um, is it plausible that all the samples are roughly equal? No, because we seem to have a large enough between, uh, between sample variants, right? So I would say no to that one. It's plausible that all the sample's variances are roughly equal. Well, that also is not necessarily what this means. It could be that these within variations are very similar to each other, but that's not what this p-value is talking about. Um, the within sample variation is much larger than the between sample variation. Well, if that were true, we would have a small f. Instead, it's this one. The between sample variation is much larger than the within. So d is our answer. All right, example three. Consider the heights of the following pairs of samples. Which will have the largest f? Which will have the smallest f? Okay, let's think about this. So players from uh, NBA team Lakers versus adults in LA. Well, if we drew those two population, right? Lakers versus LA, right? This probably has a lot of variance, right? A lot of variance here, because that's a lot of people. This probably has a very, very small variance, right? But there's probably a pretty, mm, some sizable difference between those two groups of people, right? Like average adults versus like the Lakers who are probably all amazingly tall. Well, so that's the picture here. Will this have a large F? Will it have a small F? I don't know. Not yet. Well, what about adults in San Francisco versus adults in LA? Well, these two probably both have a lot of within sample variation. There's lots of adults in San Francisco, lots of adults in LA. They're all different from each other, right? But their averages should probably be similar, right? Because it's not like San Francisco is known for super tall people or LA is known for super tall people, right? So this difference between the groups will probably be very small, but the within group variability will be very, very large, right? So I would guess this would have actually a pretty small f. And what about this one? This one is players from an NBA team, Lakers, versus players from another NBA team, the Clippers, right? And so here we might think Lakers, Clippers, right? And there's probably a pretty small variation here. Probably everybody is like above six feet tall, maybe even taller, right? Above like six four or something, right? And so they're probably all like super tall. So there's not a lot of variation. But they're also probably similar across the teams too, right? So, because probably the average height on the Lakers is probably similar to the average height on the Clippers, just because they're both super tall groups of people, right? So, which ones of these will probably have the largest F? I'm guessing the biggest difference between the groups might actually be this one, right? Um, so, I would guess, I would go with this one, given that I'm not really sure about the variance here, right? The variance is smaller, but I'm not sure how to compare these so far, right? So this is for largest f, and I'm just going to go by having the largest uh, numerator for sure, right? Well, which will have the smallest f? I would say the smallest f would probably go with this one. Because not only does it have a small numerator, but it has an extremely large denominator, right? So I would say this one would definitely have the smallest f. All right, so that's the end of f distributions.
see you next time for ANOVAS on Educator.com.